Hi. <clears throat> In this video, I'm going to talk about intersections of capitalism and patriarchy. In other words, I'm following on from the previous video where I talked about the same thing. And, and the previous video was called Neoliberal, no, Liberal Feminism and the Socialist Critique. And, and in, that, in that video, I talked about how, how I think that capitalism and patriarchy intersected to create a particular gender regime in, in, in first world in rich countries. And, and so this, this time I'm going to talk about um, the, the third world, the developing world, the majority world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and then go on to, to other topics relevant, relevant to this, you know, like the various feminist movements and so on, and, and then come to some conclusions about liberal feminism and, and the socialist critique. So, okay, so what, what, Sylvia Fed, Federici um, recently, um, or fairly recently, wrote a book, Caliban and the Witch, about, about this very topic, really, about uh, the intersections of capitalism and patriarchy. Um, and I just want to explain her hypothesis, because I think this is probably really well known in, in, the, in the left at the moment. Um, which is and third world women, she's saying, um, women from the majority world are a spearhead of anti-capitalist resistance, you know, like, <clears throat> and historically they are a target of capitalist attack. And so, so that, um, and her explanation for this is that women are defending the powerful roles that women had in pre-capitalist societies. I mean, on the one hand, she acknowledges that these, pre-capitalist societies were to a large extent patriarchal, but at the same time, she, she, she's talking about the, the way she talks about the resistance, it's in terms of the powerful roles of women, but it's also that women are defending the ecology and, and communi community owned spaces against the appropriations of capitalism in its imperialist guise, if you like, and in its early, the early capitalist period in Europe. And, and this is because uh, women are closer to nature. Um, yeah, my my analysis of this is is all a bit different. Uh, basically, I think there are the really different issues in in early capitalism in Europe and the witch crazes, you know, the witch burnings and so on, in in the core countries compared with what <clears throat> what took place in the colonial colonial period in colonization in, in, in the developing countries. So let's, let's start off by looking at the witch crazes in the, in the rich countries. And it, like, it's very difficult in many ways to understand what, what was going on in that. Um, so what we can say is that the witch burnings associated in, uh, with the end of feudal society and the initiation of capitalism in Europe, you know, like 1600s, 1700s and so on. And the people who were burnt as witches were, were more often women. Uh, they're often single older women who, who were like midwives and herbalists or, or, or just widows, really. I mean, it, it, it was very indiscriminate. <clears throat> and so, okay, so well, how do you explain this phenomen phenomenon, this, these atrocities? And, 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 and they're sort of like genocidal. I mean, nothing compares uh, and, and, until the Nazis, really that women, these older women were a target and scapegoat, if you like, for the disruptions of the end of the feudal period. You know, like they were the, the, the least powerful members of these village rural societies in feudal Europe. And, and as, as the whole thing started to fall apart and kind of feudalism collapsed, um, there was the Black Death, the huge waves of plague that swept through Europe, incredible numbers of wars like the Hundred Years War and so on, uh, in this period, civil wars like the Civil War in, in England and, and, and the enclosure movement whereby um, land, landlords took over the common spaces used by peasants to, to grow, you know, to, to, to supplement their, their, their cropping fields. Uh, you know, like where they'd graze their pigs, the, the, the woods where they'd gather acorns, for, 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 um, gather firewood, um, you know, maybe maybe hunt hunt a bit and so on. All of these areas were enclosed by by landlords, and, and in England, this is referred to as the enclosure movement because it took several centuries and 
but but basically, as as people like William Walter, the historian, describe, there were a lot of people, kind of peasant peasant people in in, in countries like England and and in in Northern Europe, who who were detached from their land, from their from from the, the sustenance that they'd come to expect, and sent you know as like in quotes vagabonds, in other words, wanderers on the street without employment. Um, and often they went to the big cities. So this is a hugely disruptive period. And, 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 and my, my hypothesis then is that the, the, one, the, the witches, like these women were, were targeted as a sort of scapegoat. Oh, it must be their fault. You know, like they're consorting with the devil and whatever, whatever. Um, I, 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 another thing, like I talked about in, in, the la, in, in my last talk, which is that cap, capitalism, compared to in feudal societies, women had a lot of independent economic power. That was, it was still patriarchal and there were ways in which women were, were controlled and exploited and oppressed and so on. But at the same time, they had a certain amount of independent economic power, uh, ro roles in which they were economically important and, and recognised as such. And the witches constituted a sort of if you like a symbol and metaphor for this for this change in into capitalism where where this was no longer the case where men take took took more control of the economic life the monetary marketplace life of the of capitalist society and and so you know like as has has been said by feminists since the early second wave you know, in the 1970s and so on um the the people who were condemned as witches were often midwives or herbalists and that these roles were being taken over by a male dominated medical profession. Uh, and, and the other thing I'd, I'd say is that in a lot of Sylvia Federici's examples from, from medieval Europe and, and, and late medieval Europe, early capitalist Europe and so on, <clears throat> are women alongside of peasant men in various kind of struggles uh, against the, against the, for, on behalf of the commons, on behalf of what the, the, the kind of, uh, land tenure that peasants had in that period uh, against enclosure, against the, the coming capitalist society. Uh, and, and also, I don't think it's out of the question that women as, as a subordinate group in this society saw, saw the sort of utopian possibilities that were opening up in this period. You know, the, the, the various revolts of the diggers and the Anabaptists and so on. And, these 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 people were looking looking at at completely egalitarian options to replace feudalism, and that's not what they got. They got capitalism instead. But at the time, it was it's understandable that women, as as a sort of marginal marginalized subordinated sex class in this period, were 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 heavily involved in these utopian movements. But I'm also saying, like I said in the last talk, this the new capitalism was an ambivalent thing for women in the, in the sense that the, the, the new industrial capitalism offered places for women as employees where they could gain an independent wage. And, and this gave them a the sort of power that they'd never had in feudal societies locked into family, patriarchal family structures. All right, now what I wanna say about the developing world is it, it really is quite different from this. You know, like there are there are echoes of of, of these changes in in medieval Europe to capitalist Europe and so on, in 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 what happened in the colonial colonized countries. But there's also huge differences, and I, and I think um, okay. So what I'd be saying is that in a general sense, that capitalist imperial power coming through you know the countries of Europe colonizing the rest of the world, we're dealing with local and different patriarchies. That you know, there's the patriarchal regimes are quite different, and, and like Southeast Asia and and the Amazon and so on, you, you can't, you know, you, they're quite r remarkably different in in what, what women's roles and men's roles were. Okay, that's the first thing. I think, as a general rule, though, that that these new imperial powers kind of like when they weren't enslaving everybody and, and just sort of dominating them in that way were also up for attracting men who they saw as a more powerful element in society by promises of paid work, by promises of, of participation to some extent, by being, by 
being given work on farm estates and mining and manufacture and so on. Um, and, and they detach rural men from their communities. And, and like we, we've, there, there, are, there are sort of research, say, for example, fishing villages in India, where, where the men are getting jobs on fishing trawlers that are, you know, new mechanized commercial fishing and, 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 and the, the local subsistence fishing that used to go on is, 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 is falling apart because of the competition. And, and the, okay, so this is the sort of thing that's, that's taking place that men are being pulled out of their rural communities into um, market-based market employment. And, and, and what you could say about this is that it follows the capitalist assumptions of the rich countries, the metropolitan countries, the countries where the, the, the capitalist gender regime had already been put in place, where there was the idea that women were at, would stay at home or if they were employed, they'd be, it'd be temporary and they'd be paid lower wages and so on, and that men would be the main in quotes, breadwinners. And, and so as the capitalists came into developing countries, they, they made these assumptions and they, they tr structured things in this way. Now, what, what did that mean for, for, for these societies? Well, one of, the, one of the patterns that's really common is that um, men were not paid high wages. I mean, God, the colonial imperial regime didn't want to do that. So they'd pay them really barely subsistence wages, but really low wages. And, and what, what, what they expected and, what, and what, what developed and what they encouraged to develop was a situation where women would stay in their rural villages, would bring up the children, where the, where the, the men would migrate to, to work in, in, you know, landed estates or <clears throat> or mining or, you know, manufacturing or whatever. Uh, and the women would, would, would be responsible for maintaining the subsistence work, the provision of basic food supplies for the family and especially for the children being, being brought up in these rural areas. <clears throat> and so like, you know, in other, in, in other words, that, that, that rural agricultural work became a kind of housework as far as the capitalist regime in developing countries was concerned. It was unpaid labor, it was done mainly by women. And what, what, what did this do in terms of politics? Well, it put women in the position of having to defend community resources against new capitalist incursions. While men were otherwise occupied, while men were looking for jobs, while men were out of the community, you know, why especially young, healthy men were, were out, were out might maybe working in a mine or, you know, working in, in town or whatever. Okay, so this explains a kind of phenomenon that, say, Vandana Shiva talks about the Chipko protest where um, peasant women went out and hugged trees that the forest, Indian forestry department was trying to cut down. And, and, the, and, and from the point of view of these peasant women, these were resources of their community that they used, you know, like they'd go out to the forest to get wood, to get, you know, um, various uh, for, forest herbs and, and, and foods and stuff like that. And, um, and, and, the, and these resources were being threatened. And, and, and so the, the stuff that Federici is talking about makes it heaps of sense in this context. It's not because women were innately closer to nature. It was because the colonial imperialist regime had put women in this position of defending community subsistence resources against the incursions of, of, of new, yet new incursions of capitalist appropriation. And while men were kind of out of the picture. And this is not a, a uniform situation across the world. I mean, like... <laughs> even between one African country and another. Like, okay, so, so in South Africa, I found that men regarded as beneath their dignity to work at subsistence agriculture. That it was almost always done by women. I'm, I'm not saying that ne never, never, there were some um, mixed couples, you know, husband and wife doing agriculture, but, but mostly men, men were looking for jobs, you know, like, to be to maintain masculine dignity was a, uh, the best thing was to have an income of some kind which involved working in in part of the you know the commerce or the government or whatever and being paid a wage and so they wouldn't involve themselves in subsistence agriculture despite the fact that it was absolutely essential in these rural communities that this agriculture be done and so it was being done almost exclusively by women 
However, move to Zimbabwe, you know, the huge economic collapse during the Mugabe regime. And, and, and suddenly what you find in, 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 in Zimbabwe is you go around the same sort of fields that you're looking at in South Africa. And, and there are a lot more men out there in the fields doing subsistence agricultural work. So, so, so this kind of division that uh, is, is not, you know, the same everywhere. And the last thing I'd say in relationship to Sylvia Federici's hypothesis is that, the, yeah, there's sort of witchcraft resistance as part of anti-colonial resistance in every developing country. And, and there's witchcraft that's a sort of form of lateral violence in every developing country as well. But it's like, it, whereas in Europe, witchcraft is associated with women and mainly witches were burnt, were mainly women, that's not really true in developing countries. You know, like witchcraft like, is, is, is not a gendered phenomena in the same way. And it's really misleading to, to think of it in that way. All right, now what I want to talk about is the two feminist movements, you know, like the first wave and the second wave. The first wave, 1850 to 1920. Okay, so what was driving that and, and what were the sort of discurs discursive resources that, w that went into that, to that, to that struggle? Okay, so we could talk about liberalism in, 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 it, in its John Stuart Mill sense, you know, like Harriet w w Wollstonecraft and so on. The French Revolution, the demand for equality, liberty and fraternity and so on, and that was taken up by women who, who, who were making the same demands. Well, you know, if men can be citizens, so can we. Uh, and like that's that's the central demand of the first wave feminist movement. What this was also associated with is the dropping family size in the middle and upper class. So so I mean you know and I've studied this in in, in some detail um, you know decades ago, but it's like it was in the 19th century in, in England in particular, which I know most about. Where where the size of the family started to drop in the in the in the middle middle and upper class, there were there were there was also the phenomenon. There were a lot of single women who, who 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 were not who were unmarried for a whole lot of reasons, and and, and this 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 gave was the sort of social resource, if you like, which fed into first wave feminism. And we can look at two key figures in relationship to the, like Florence Nightingale, a single woman who engineered the, 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 uh, the movement of women into nursing as a form of employment, right? At the time it was massively contested um, and, and it made various, she also made various reforms to hospitals that made, made them sanitary places where people actually wouldn't get sicker. Um, so, so a hugely influential figure, and basically what, what she's doing, if you like, is challenging the division of between, uh, in, the, in the middle class, between the, the unpaid uh, woman staying at home, you know, do, if she's not married and have ki has kids, then she's just doing needlework and doing, looking after her parents and all this sort of crap. Okay, Florence Nightingale challenges that and says, let's move into something more useful. And then the other person I want to mention is Mari Stopes. Okay, so Mari Stopes led this huge campaign to make contraception available to women. And, and of course, what this allowed was this falling size of the, of the middle class family. And, and of course, and in turn, what this also allowed was women to devote more time and energy into, into running the political struggle that was the first wave feminist movement. And, and in Foucault's terms, when we, he talks about a hegemonic discourse being reversed, whereas the value, the value uh, elements of that discourse get, get changed and, and yet the underlying understandings stay the same. You know, he calls that a reversal of discourse. Well, okay, so what we get here is a reversal of the discourse of moral mother, right? If women are the more moral sex and, and the first wave feminist movement didn't challenge that idea, then, then women should enter politics to exercise their moral virtue in the political realm. And there were the temperance movements were mainly run by women. And that was part of the push to get women in, into parliament and so on and so forth. And so what we could say about this first wave feminist movement is that there was a limited challenge to the patriarchal division of labor 
and 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 the and the gen and the gendered cultures of femininity and masculinity, you know, that I talked about in in my last talk. And the main thing that they that they were on about was was getting the vote, which by about nineteen twenty and nineteen twenty five and so on, it started to be achieved. All right, now let's look at second wave feminism. I mean, these 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 feminist movements are also part of the articulation of the resistance to patriarchy in, in relationship to capitalism. <clears throat> so, okay, so what was feeding into that? Well, first of all, the counterculture of resistance to Puritan roles for women and for Puritanism and the work ethic in it. I mean, you know, what we could call as the hippies, don't know? Okay. Uh, and, 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 and like the whole, the whole moral mother thing basically was challenged by the, by the ethic of hedonism and free love and so on. So for a start, you know, there, there's, there's the counterculture of the 60s feeds into the women's liberation movement of the, of the late 60s, early 70s. Then there's a new left. The new left developed out of the critique of Stalinism in, in the 50s and 60s. And, and, base, and one of the things that the new left was saying was that um, the kind of workerist emphasis on discipline and control and, and you know, hierarchy and so on was something which had to be overthrown. And of course, this had implications for women too, because they're in a hierarchical patriarchal family situation or being dominated by men at work. And, and, and you know, and so, so so this anti-hierarchy uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, and, and of the new left fed into women's liberation. And then there were the various so-called liberation movements like the black civil rights movement in the United States. Um, you know, and then later on the Black Panthers, a, a much more militant revolutionary w wing of that struggle. At the same time, you know, like the, 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 the anti-colonial struggle in, in Vietnam, if you like, or the communist struggle of North Vietnam against the South was, was described, the, the, the army of North Vietnam described itself as, uh, or, the, or the, sorry, the Viet Cong described themselves formally as the National Liberation Front for South Vietnam or for Vietnam, whatever. Okay, so, and, and like uh, women as part of the student movement against the Vietnam War were heavily involved in this and they just went, you know, you know, we're defending the rights of these third world people against colonial capitalist imperialism and so on, da da da. And and here we are doing, doing doing all the shit work. We're doing all the administrative work that's making these leftist male heroes get up and give speeches in in, in university campuses across the United States and making the heroic gestures and so. On. Well, enough of this. You know, what about women's liberation? And like I I was there in 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 nine. In, whenever it was 1970 or 1968 or something when Kate Jennings gave the famous speech on the front lawn at Sydney University that would, which was part of the initiation of women's liberation in Australia and 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 yeah she was part of that student movement against the Vietnam War and she got up and made exactly these kind of comments which were also before that being made in America by American movement what we call it was called the movement you know American movement women and then the context of all of this, which I, I, you know, as a materialist, I can't help talking about this, but the context was, was, was the women's rights to abortion, you know, like that's one thing, and reproductive technology, but also, you know, like the pill. I mean, heaps of women that, I, that I, and you know, I'm on the cusp of all of this, right? So heaps of older women that, that I knew had, had either terrible illegal abortions or they had children out of wedlock that were sort of hidden away. They, they were taken off from their mothers. I mean, massively traumatic experiences of forced, you know, forced reproduction, let's say. Like the pill really changed that. Now, my sister was two years younger than me and, and, and her friends in high school, a lot, of, a lot of them, and of course, this is a middle-class Sydney suburb and so on, a lot of them were, were in having, having sex at the age of 16, 17, 18, and so on, stuff like that. And they were on the pill. Now, the pill was a terrible technology. I don't, I, I don't want to minimise that for a minute. Lots of women became extremely sick from the pill. But at the same time, what it did was get, give women a lot more control over, over, over reproduction than they'd had previously and gave them the opportunity of maintaining 
you know, jobs and training and careers, et cetera, in a, in a context where, where previously that had been blocked by, by accidental and unintended pregnancies and childbirth and having to get married and all this sort of stuff. And not to mention the trauma of those events, which I talked about before. And so this second wave feminism move, movement was aimed to break the patriarchal construction of gender as such. You know, there would no longer be particular types of masculine behaviour and particular types of feminine behaviour. That the, the, the aim was that women would enter the fields that were previously reserved to men and that men would enter the fields that were previously reserved for women and and that and that wages would be equal and men would do an equal share of the housework <clears throat> and then in terms of sexuality that women would initiate and enjoy and take pleasure in sex is the opposite of the moral mother idea of femininity <clears throat> and be protected from sexual violence and not expect sexual violence from men the, you know so 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 in this you know in, in all of these ways the second wave feminism radicalized feminist feminism compared to the first wave and we and, and i'm like i you know i don't want to be picky but basically i don't i, I don't take the the term third wave feminism that seriously i mean i i, I can sort of certainly see some changes in the, the way fem, feminism is articulated but basically we're still living from a from a broader historical point of view we're still living with the effects and attempts of second wave feminism all right so now having done all that i'm now going to talk about liberal feminism and the socialist critique again and kind of round up with that let's see how many pages. i seem to have a large number of pages for that hmm, three <laughs> okay so capitalism as an economic system and i stress that because i'll talk about some of the other aspects of it in a minute does not depend on women being an underclass relative to men. You know, capitalism always depends on an underclass, you know, like a hierarchical division of labor, different rates of pay, you know, a whole lot of people unemployed who, who, who drive down wages, all of these things, you know, and especially in the third world versus the, the, the rich world and all of these hierarchical divisions of the, of the, the non-capitalist 99%. Yes, absolutely. But it doesn't depend upon women being an underclass relative to men. So economically, capitalists could pay men less and pay women more. That would not be a huge economic problem for them. Men could do more housework and less paid work and women could do more paid work and less housework. Again, not a huge problem for the profits of the capitalist class. The capitalist class would be no worse off from a purely economic point of view. In, in a sense, then, that, that, that understanding is the strength of liberal feminism. That's why liberal feminism has legs and why, and why, and, and why you know, and, and not, just, not just in the upper middle class, but in any class in, in, in modern society, there, there's a feminist struggle going on, which goes, we can achieve more power relative to the men in our lives, you know, within the context of capitalism. You know, it's, it seems like a feasible pro program. That's, that's, important to realize that <clears throat> one of the ideas of 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 the second wave feminism that however is very difficult to implement in the, the context of capitalism that's to pay women for housework because <clears throat> the way capitalism works is that everyone's desperate to get a job or to 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 shack up with someone who's got a job or whatever to get income you know, and then without income, you don't live well, right? I mean, if, you, if you're on the dole, you're not living well, you'll be living on the poverty line. If capitalism was to suddenly decide to give women as 50% of the population, you know, when they've got like children under 16, let's say, or, or you know, or at any stage of their lives, wages for housework, that, that pressure gets relieved, right? That pressure gets relieved and what does that lead to it leads to escalating demands for control for for, for to end exploitation and work and to uh, to challenge the rule of the capitalist class so that's not a particularly likely thing to happen within the context of liberal feminism within the context of a capitalist economic regime i i regard it as unlikely in the same way that i regard the universal basic income as unlikely in the context of capitalism 
So anyway, the liberal feminist program is not totally stupid. And there have been some important successes, paid parenting leave, supporting parents benefit, abortion rights, the entry of women into paid work, massive change between, you know, like 1960 and, and the present time, you know, percentage of women in the, in the workforce and so on, huge changes. Changes into culture related to gendered violence, like the most recently, the Me Too movement and how that's, that's affected things. Some state assistance to childcare in certain countries of the world, like in, you know, Sweden, obviously, and, and Australia to some degree, but I mean, not, not it. Inadequate, you'd have to say, but 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 nevertheless, better than nothing, better than poking the eyes burn stick. Some media presence for strong women characters, you know, like going back to Cagney and Lacey, the old detective story. But I mean, you know, like it's obviously, um, you know, Wonder Woman or whatever. I mean, the, 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 these these things are sort of like they would have been harder to to run in the fifties. Not that there weren't, you know, important feminist elements in popular films at any stage of history. But anyway, it's true that this liberal reformist feminism, I call it reformist in the sense of not, not changing capitalist society, right? Only reforming capitalism rather than getting rid of it. It doesn't solve class problems for working class black and third world, for warm, world women. You know, that's absolutely right. The socialist critique is spot on as far as that's concerned underemployment, low wages, health problems, nutrition, fucking starvation in, in large parts of the third world and so on. Only the overthrow of capitalism can actually make a dent in these problems that are problems for women and also for men. However, what, what also needs to be said is that the demands of liberal feminism or feminism in general are not irrelevant to women in these in these situations within the context of capitalism these these demands are about within any particular class niche um, they're they're re relevant to women relative to men of their class who are now controlling them and, and and dominating them economically within that class so entry to men's jobs women's sports paid work domestic violence sexual assault and so on. These, these are all things which are, are promoted by liberal feminists and by feminists in general, and that, 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 that can be managed within each class fraction to a certain extent within the context of capitalism. But what, what, what we can also say is that up until now, the second wave feminist movement is still falling short. I mean, Oh, the persistence of unequal shares of housework, you know, the persistence of the difference in pay, the persistence of the fact that um, that women are out of the labor, often out of the labor market for the period of their uh, of their kids' early lives, um, the discouragement to to women by the by high cost of childcare in terms of the labor market and so on, the dependence of women on men economically in every class niche but more obviously more so in the middle class than in, in, in the working class and underclass. But a key problem is the failure to make huge inroads into the economic gender disparity in every class niche. Women are dependent on husbands, especially with young children. <clears throat> and, and this is especially true of middle class families, but not only just middle class families. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like, I, I'll come back to that. What, what, I mean, in a sense, what, what, what you need to do to think about that is what would be a solution to that, which is something I'm going to come back to. The ruling class is ambivalent about liberal feminism. It's not necessarily seen as a threat to the class power of, of the capitalist class. They're not, the capitalists are not averse to employing women at whatever wages make economic sense. So if women are industrially strong and, and demand and get higher wages uh, or equal wages to men, I mean, obviously the capitalists will fight every wage increase, but they'd be quite happy with the situation where men's wages dropped and women's went up. Not a big problem. But, but, the, but why they're ambivalent is that men also dominate the ruling class. You know, it's not just in in the working class and in the middle class that men dominate. It's also in the ruling class. So, you know, as men, they're not mad keen on liberal feminism. And, and this is reflected in the ambivalence of the mainstream media, you know, 
some sections of the mainstream media are quite feminist and have lots of feminist content and, and other sections of the mainstream media, uh, you know, reflect patriarchal power in various ways. So then, okay, so, so to me, what makes sense is a multi-niche independent feminist movement. Multi-niche, I mean multi-class niche, multi-ethnic niche, multi-country niche, you know, like in developing countries, you need a different one. In each developing country, you need a different kind of feminist movement. An emphasis on the necessity, necessity of socialism for all but ruling class women. I mean, that's another thing we need to, to acknowledge. We, we need a socialist revolution or, you know, an anti-capitalist revolution, let's say, say that. Okay, now this is, this, is, this is an important topic. Okay, so, so what I'm going to say now is that what liberal feminists don't get about the relationship between capitalism and patriarchy, and, and this, is not an, this is not the economic stuff that I've been talking about so far. It's, it's sort of kind of sense a deeper issue. And what I'm going to say is as a psychological structure, capitalism absolutely depends on patriarchy. It's not the way liberal feminists, what's not, liberal feminists think that capitalism and patriarchy, patriarchy are independent, you know, exists, you can get rid of one and still have the other and so on. No, that's not right. It's not like the socialist critique thinks either. It's not that capitalism causes patriarchy, that's complete rubbish, just do any historical or cross-cultural study and you'll find, that, no, that's not the case. Not even class society, you know, there are classless, let, let, let me say, the indigenous societies that were patriarchal, in fact, most. No, no, it's the other way around. The causal link between patriarchy and capitalism goes the other way. Patriarchy, patriarchy is one of the key causes of capitalism and class society in general. The paradox of liberal feminism is this, if liberal feminism was ever to totally work and succeed and getting equal power in every class niche and so on, from between men and women and so on, it would actually destroy capitalism. That's something nobody knows. No, no one, no one recognises that. You know, liberal feminists don't realise that. The ruling class doesn't know that. No, it's, it's, it's hidden knowledge. I mean, it's, it's obvious when you think about it, but it's hidden People can't look at that directly. It's too too scary, if you like. Okay, so what? Why is there this relationship? Well, the the first reason: the patriarchal family with the father dominant and so on is a model for and a large part of the cause of the psychological structures of dominance and submission that operate in class societies. So every ruling class models itself on the ruling father in the family. And people as infants and small children are trained to accept this dominance and submission pattern and internalize this as the way things ought to be. Oh, you always need a leader. Oh, yeah, someone's got to be the boss. Oh, yeah. In any society, somebody will come to the top, you know, da, 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 da. you know, right. So this, this, this is, and this is how people operate, you know, like they either operate as like the subordinate boss. Oh, yes, okay, whatever you like. Or they operate. You know, subordinate employees, sorry, yeah. or they operate as, as the nasty authoritarian boss. Now, for your own good, you must do this, you know, like, okay, so it's like this, this psychological relationships at the heart of class societies in general, of which capitalism's a prime example. That's the first reason. The second reason is a bit more tricky. It's the absence of men from nurturing care of infants is typical of all patriarchies. Men abstain from this, you know, boring and mundane and emotionally well, how, attaching, you know, like it's like sticky glue that prevents you from doing other things. They avoid, avoid all of this. Right. And, and this, the consequence of this, as I explain in other talks and go back to my other talks, you know, on toxic masculinity to understand this, is anxious masculinity and competitive masculinity. Class societies also depend on this, you know. We're boys together and we're fighting those other evil men who are less than, less than men, less than real men. <coughs> you know, like it doesn't matter whether it's an, a, an army taking over India or, 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 or you know, 
or two capitalists fighting over a company. I mean, it's like, it's every, it's everywhere it, 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 within class societies that this kind of competitive masculinity structures class relationships. So a successful revolution, a feminist, successful feminist revolution could bring down class society and bring down capitalism because in a sense, men would just lose their motivation to be involved in these competitive games. That's an optimistic idea, isn't it? Um, but it's unlikely to do that without a socialist struggle. Like these two, two, two kind of struggles are complementary. And that comes back to what I promised at the beginning of, of, of both of the, these, these two talks, which is that men actually have an interest, you know, as socialists, let's say, in feminism. You know, I don't, I don't mean an altruistic instance. They have, they have that, 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 that motivation as well. You know, they just like women and want them to do well. Yeah, sure, that's true too. But, but what I'm talking about is they have a selfish interest. If we want to get rid of class society and start to live in, you know, like real people and have fun and so on, we need, we need to, get, to get rid of patriarchy and, and, that, and that's the key thing. All right, and now what have I got as my last thing? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, so I promise this. How, how would a gender egalitarian socialist gift economy work and solve the problem of patriarchy? All right, so we've got a society without any money where people engage in productive work like in a voluntary club format where, where communities come together to decide what things need to be produced and to whom, to whom they're going to be offered, you know, like promised, contracted, compacted, let's say, you know, not a contract involving money, but a compact involving an agreement, right? That's, that's the framework, right? That's the socialist post-capitalist framework that I think can possibly work, right? Okay, so what will we do? The first thing we do is gender deconstruction to any extent possible. Men would be, be involved in the care of infants. Men would be doing a fair share of housework. Men would be in caring jobs like this is already starting to happen, like nursing and so on. The second, all work, domestic, industrial and clerical, would be unpaid right, and run by voluntary collectives. Workers would have control over distribution and donate their goods and services voluntarily, either to their own communities, you know, like a community garden, a community agricultural project, whatever, uh, or to another community, like making, you know, turntables for record players and exchanging them with another community, which makes amps and so on, you know, those kind of things, right? <coughs> so the effect of that in terms of gender is that there's an equivalence of the different work types that are currently gendered. So whereas now some work types are paid and some are unpaid, that, that, that would go down completely. Like domestic work in that context, childcare and all that, would be just work, not that different to doing the community garden or, or repairing the windmill or something. These are all work. They're equivalent. They're not, they're, they're not paid. They're, the, the people get together and work out how they're going to do them and share, share the tasks. And then, all right, going on from that, the jobs regarded as particularly mundane, boring, you know, and nobody wants to do that, etc., would be shared with any, within any collective in, in rotation. So, okay, let's, how, how would that work in the hospital? Well, the medical work that would be being done would obviously be being done by trained staff, but those trained staff would also be doing menial work, like doing the, the cleaning and so on. And the people who are our cleaners would also be trained in doing medical work and do that medical work. <coughs> the assumption is that there aren't that many differences between people that are innate you know, intellectual differences. That's just a myth of this society that you know, some people are only fitted for menial work. What a load of baloney. <laughs> and it's like, we, we, we need a society where people are trained in what they need to do to, to, to enjoy a, a diversity of experiences in their working life and, 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 and be forced to do, if, if necessary, you know, like some people may enjoy some parts of menial work or it might be regarded as meditation in the context of other jobs, but like, there's no job that's too menial to be done. And if, and if a collective 
wants to rotate and roster those jobs, then that's what they'll do. <coughs> and then the final thing, you know, whereas w women can be isolated and dependent on 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 the favours of men to to get to get economic assistance within a gift economy it, it doesn't work like that the whole community is responsible for looking after everyone in that community and so <coughs> the, it's a community responsibility to give adequate support to people and individuals not it's not an individual family matter people can't be you know women, women in particular with with young kiddies can't be cast into a situation of of unpleasant dependence because uh, because something goes wrong in their relationship either the the, the you know if they're in a heterosexual relationship a lot a lot of households would be com communes you know like with more than i mean i live in a three person commune at the moment but like without w w w without no, no, not necessarily in 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 that pattern in the old pattern and there'd be a lot more community solidarity you know like people coming together with their neighbors in 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 working bees to to work on the community garden or the or the bike path or whatever <coughs> or or you know and so there's a lot more intervention and there's a lot more spaces where the, the sort of you know the family where 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 horrible things happen and nobody knows about it it, it just it, it it wouldn't society wouldn't be organized in that way okay i'll finish with that thank you <laughs>